Hey there viewers and welcome back to the self made auto channel so likely to be one of the most debated topics next to the am I a mechanic or a technician topic is do I need a lab scope in my shop you know is it necessary uh, in my opinion that's just my opinion I'll let you guys decide by the end of the video is you know do you need it or not ultimately it's up to you in my opinion Yes, you do. Uh, I've had one in my shop in one form or another, whether it was on my old Modus, the Varus. Uh, you know, I've got a Handtech, I've got a, you know, the Altel. Uh, since about 2005 when I started here, I've always had one. And then at my prior shop, uh, we had one there also on an older Modus. And then even before that, we said the Snap-on Counselor too. So if you've been around long enough, uh, you're familiar with that, or some people used to see them as the sun machine. So your old engine analyzers or ignition analyzers, they were fantastic for secondary ignition, and they still are, uh, even today, they still work fantastic. Uh, so what I want to bring up is, you know, how does your shop, or how do you handle, you know, a situation perhaps like what I have on this Chevy Equinox. So behind me, we have a 2010 Chevrolet Equinox that has a 3.0 with the infamous P0016 and P0017 codes. Uh, I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you the process in which I use to diagnose it to make a 100% definitive call. And then I guess with all that, we can determine, you know, is the lab scope necessary or what other route could you use? Just take a peek here. So these are the codes that I pulled out of the car when it came in. Now it had a whole host of codes in it and, and other modules, tire pressure sensor business and whatnot. These are the ones that we're most concerned with. The money light's on. So you can see we got a uh, crank staff position, intake cam position, not plausible bank one. And then the same for exhaust cam position on bank one. Um, so what we can do from there, or what, what it would be my habit to do if I wasn't familiar with these codes, is to look up the code setting criteria for them. Uh, so we can do that real quick. All right, so we can have a look. Uh, we look under the uh, conditions for setting this code. So the code 16, 17, 18, 19 all have to deal with uh, the camshaft, you know, correlation. Um, ED, the ECM detects that one camshaft is misaligned with the crankshaft, did I say camshaft? Yeah, so the camshaft misaligned with the crankshaft, ECM detects one of the following conditions. Intake cam on bank one, greater than nine degrees retarded or 12 degrees advanced in relationship to the crankshaft. And then for the exhaust cam, it's 10 degrees retarded, 13 degrees advanced in relationship to the crankshaft. Uh, and then it goes on with bank two, uh, where it gives it 11 degrees retarded, 13 degrees advanced on the intake and then on the exhaust uh, nine degrees or 13 degrees so a little little bit of variance for their code setting criteria there uh, so now that we can see what the intake uh, looks for we can make an assessment as to you know what we have to do um, so come down we can look at uh, see diagnostic aids what all does it say it looks for recent mechanical repairs um, inspect for you know an incorrectly installed secondary timing chain can cause this issue um, you know and you can read down through you know obviously for yourself there and see uh, the reason that I personally feel that we need a scope for this is you know do I want to take and spend you know the eight hours or five hours whatever it takes to pull the engine cover to have a look to see if the timing is bad, to see if the cam phasers work. Um, you know, to me that seems like a lot of work when I personally feel that it can be done, you know, a lot quicker and a lot more precise. So it's a situation like this where I, I personally believe that the lab scope excels uh, and can give you some definitive answers and save, you know, somewhat of a guess, I would say. Granted, based on code setting criteria, the timing should actually be off on this you know it raises a couple questions for me uh, there are multiple service bulletins on this engine as a matter of fact GM actually extended warranties on these up to 120,000 I believe this is over that right now this car's got about 124,000 on it so it's a smidge out of warranty but they have updates for you know cam thrust washers they have bulletins on the uh, crankshaft reluctor wheel actually turning on the crankshaft 
So, you know, what if you were in a situation where you pulled that time of cover, you got permission from the customer, and, you know, you called them up and said, hey, we got these codes, we don't know anything, we got to pull the timing cover to have a look. And all of a sudden you pull the timing cover and find out, oh, shoot, you know, everything's dead on the money. You know, now what do you do? Uh, because the engine's tore apart, you can't do any more testing. So at that point, you know, do you pull the oil pan and physic, you know, uh, visually inspect the crankshaft, reluctor, uh, you know, where do you go from there, I guess, is my next step. So in my opinion, I like to gather as much data as I can prior to tearing into it because once the valve covers are off, the intake, the time of cover, you pull the engine out to do that, you know, now what? You know, how do you know that your cam phasers worked, intake and exhaust, front and rear bank, same for, um, you know, the cam sensors, you know, how do you know that that crank, you know, uh, reluctor wheel is lined up perfectly you know, short of tearing it apart and looking at it, the answer to that is, you know, the lab scope. I'm not trying to sell lab scopes, I'm just trying to kind of promote their use, perhaps, you know, whatever one it is that you have. You know, here I'm using my Pico. Uh, but I'll show you, you know, the next step that I did was to get a wiring diagram, as I've done in the past, or as it is always my habit to do, to find, you know, you know, all four cam signals, the crankshaft signal, grab our scope, hook it up, gather the waveforms, see how the cam is in relationship to the crankshaft, and I guess I will say that, say this, you need a known good. Uh, GM will typically take their cam sensors, and they're usually kind of a mirror image of each other, you know, they overlap intakes, overlap intakes, exhaust, overlap exhaust, typically, not always, but how is that in relationship to the cam? Can you take that measurement and see, yes, this cam is, you know, 20 degrees difference of you know, out of 720 degrees of what it's supposed to be or what my known good is, you know, am I outside that range to set this code or is my crankshaft reluctor gone cattywampus on me and or is there some other underlying problem that's not in the code setting criteria that you can see. So I guess I, I hope that makes sense, but I'll show you how I'm hooked up. I'm going to show you the waveforms that I gathered and then we're going to take a quick peek at them to make the call on this to be able to call the customer and say, here's what you need 100%. No questions asked. So what I did with the wiring diagram, I came over and I always label my, you know, you get, get a lot of wires going, I like to label them. Uh, but I got bank two exhaust cam, bank two intake, bank one intake, bank one exhaust, and then the crank sensor. So being only having a four channel scope, which this is probably one of the few times you need more than four channels, I'll do, you know, bank one intake and exhaust versus crank, and then bank two intake exhaust uh, in accompanied with the crank. So instead of recording these uh, for you guys live and taking up that kind of time, you can see, uh, or I can show you here, that I've recorded um, bank one cam crank, bank two cam crank, like I, uh, like I had mentioned to you. Of course, I got all four cam sensors on one screen. And I was fortunate enough to go on the IETN network uh, and find a bank one and bank two that were listed as known goods. Now, I always take that with a grain of salt because there was no other information published with them. They weren't published as you know, cam actuators both unplugged, which is a uh, typical habit you would do to uh, gather, you know, cam waveforms on a variable valve timing engine, is do it with the actuators unplugged. That way there, there's not that variable. So I'm assuming that these are good uh, because that's how they were posted. I checked with Keith also to see if he had any, and he did not on this engine, oddly enough. Uh, so here is our one from IETN. So what, what we'll do, and I think this is where, you know, the scope shines. Uh, fortunately, the guy did label his channels. He's got this one, uh, channel A, which is our blue, labeled as crank. Uh, channel B, which is red, is our intake. And the green channel, channel C, is our exhaust. Oh, excuse me, I gotta sneeze. Let's see here. <coughs> oh, there we go, excuse me. Uh, so let's see. So we're going to set up some cursors. Now this again is the waveform that I got from IETN. So we're going to pick up 720 degrees of our crankshaft. So I want to get our, our cursors. We'll pick a you know a common spot here. I want to get them as, as close as possible. Ah, stinking cold. So there's that. So there is 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation and it's going to be 360 degrees of our camshaft rotation. 
we can take, we'll pull up another ruler here, we'll mark our 360 spot, I was going to say it should come to that falling edge uh, on our crankshaft. So now that we have that set up, we can take some measurements. Uh, what we'll do is we're going to pull up, this is the capture that I had taken, and I have my, let's see here, so we've got, uh, we're just going to swap these, so this is our intake. I was fortunate enough to record it exactly how he had it. Makes it a little bit easier when you come to start fiddling around there. Just kind of fits the eye a little bit better. Let's see, how do we want to do this? We want to go here. We just want to make sure we have the same. Everything represented the same. And you can see down in my notes, you know, which pin they were hooked to and everything else. So what I'm going to do is we'll drag our, our cursors. We'll do the same thing that we, we can take the same type of measurements as we do uh, on our known good. That way we have, you know, something to reference it from. Sometimes it's be better to have more than one known good. All right, so this is ours. This is in, you can see up here on the top of the screen, 2010 Equinox, Bank One. And then what we'll do is we'll flip back to the known good. Now there's multiple ways to do this is, you know, you could do a overlay uh, with the Pico lots of options here uh, I think what we'll do is we'll just set up a cursor right there so that's going to be our zero degree mark that's where we're going to take our measurements from and we'll just measure out to uh, this is going to be our exhaust so it throws a code for this so the, the rising edge of our exhaust first cam signal is at 31 degrees this is supposedly a known good and then we're going to flip over to ours we'll set the cursor up here Get that at zero. Get my fingers to work. There we go. And then we'll go to our rising edge here. Best we can. Close enough. And then what do we have here? Our delta is 42 degrees. So we'll go back to our known good. Oops. So there's our known good. 31 degrees. We go back to ours, it's 42 degrees, so that's a 10 degree, it's uh, our waveform on the exhaust cam in reference to the crankshaft is 10 degrees retarded, more retarded than our known good. Uh, so that stands to reason with our code, and now we can do the same thing for the intake. Uh, this, is, this is ours, this is the car we collected off, uh, our delta is 131 degrees. And then we'll go back to the known good. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so what do we have here? This is 118 degrees on our known good. Uh, so that's, uh, what are we at, 13, right? Yeah, roughly. Um, yeah, terrible with mass, so 120, uh, 11, yeah. So we are, <coughs> excuse me, I guess I'm blowing my nose. So we're what, 131 and 118. So yeah, about 13 degree variance. Uh, don't mind my cold today, folks, I'm sorry. Just trying to get some work done. Uh, so that's about a 13 degree variance, and it is also retarded in comparison to our known good. So we can physically see that. Now we could also go through, uh, if we chose to do so, which I've already done on bank two. So as I mentioned, I'd gone through and done bank two. Now when I compare bank two uh, to our known good, you know, it was good. It was within three or four degrees, both intake and exhaust. Now my engine compared to the known good, my engine was slightly retarded those three or four degrees. If that known good is indeed good, I'm well within the code setting criteria, and that's why we're not getting a code for this bank, you know, however we're getting it for the back bank. The other thing you can do while you have the scope hooked up, you have the question, well, you know, is it, is it my timing that's changed, or is it, you know, the cam phasers that are gone wonky? In this case, because it generates a code so quickly, I cannot actuate my cam phasers to move my cam shaft you know, a given amount of degrees from zero to, I think, 25 degrees, it'll move it, you know, advance or retard it, I'd have to look to be sure. When it generates that code, you can't use the scan tool because it just doesn't allow you to use that bi-directional control. 
Now I did do it on bank two just for the sake of doing it and watch it on the scan tool. And you can see, you know, you'll watch that camshaft move and then you'll watch it return back to its lock pin. Uh, however, using the scope, I was able to go through and make some, you know, good decisions and say, you know, yes, our cam uh, reluctor wheel has not rotated on the crankshaft or our crankshaft reluctor wheel, I guess for that matter, hasn't rotated. Uh, our front bank indeed is good. However, you know, our rear bank, the code is dead on the money uh, and it is, you know, retarded outside of its, you know, acceptable range. So with all that being seen, you know, a quick test, didn't have to pull the cover to, you know, have a look per se. We had a look without pulling anything apart. You know, I took the cover. This is all I pulled apart. I pulled a little plastic cover off the ECM connector X3 grab my wires and you know now we know now we know with confidence that when we go in there or we call a customer um, you know we get the updated time and chain kit and the guides and uh, you know the phasers everything that GM has a bazillion updates for but at least you know we're not going in blind now on this particular car you probably could have loaded up the parts cannon so hey they got a bolt in it needs all these parts and you'd have been right but like I say what happens if you get in there and you find out you know the crankshaft has moved or uh, I was just at my brother's shop, and they had a, a truck setting a, I don't remember, it was a lost RPM signal code above 2,000 RPMs, and that actually had a crack in the cam gear reluctor wheel. So centrifugally, it would start to open up, but only 2,000 RPMs. When you visually inspected that, we barred that engine over. I looked at it with my own eyes. Each gap was there. I mean, the thing was spot on. You watch it on a scope, all of a sudden, you know, now you've got this other timing mark. Uh, it was pretty cool to see. In that case, there is no way to figure that out without a scope, bottom line, unless you were to pull the whole front cover off it and, you know, really examine it with, you know, a magnifying glass to see that crack. It was, it was pretty cool. And there's multiple instances where, you know, a scope is the answer. You know, let's say you're looking at the CAN data bus. You know, what are, what are you going to do? I mean, you, you need it. Um, you know, or any of the data buses on the, on the network for that matter, you know, whether it's a low speed network, a high speed, um, you know, you name it, you gotta have a scope to look at it. So I'll be interested to see what you guys say in the comment box below. Let me know your thoughts on it or, um, you know, even moving forward, you know, have you looked at scopes? Have you entertained the idea of buying one? Do you, you know, and what's the hang up if you don't want to buy one or if you haven't made the purchase on one yet? Is it, you know, lack of know-how, lack of whatever, you know, you, you tell me, uh, I'll be interested to see the comment box, you know, perhaps this can inspire some other videos where we show some more basic scope usage. I am not an advanced scope user. I know how to use it within my limitations and I can fix cars with it and make diagnoses. Uh, you know, if those are videos you guys want to see and, you know, need some help just getting started, you know, where am I going to use this? How am I going to use it? You know, let me know in the comment box. Perhaps we can uh, make some videos in that direction. Basic hookup and usage. Uh, the Pico is fantastic. It has a ton of actual help on there, automotive type help that you can use, uh, presets and everything like that. Just get you going. So, uh, anyhow, we'll leave it at that. I gotta call and give this guy the bad news now. These are expensive. What are you gonna do? Now I know. So, anyhow, find us on our socials, Patreon, all that business. And just remember, viewers, if I can do it. You can do it. Thanks for watching.